Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to the, the early session today. Good morning. My name is Greg Miller, and I'm an investigative security reporter for the Washington Post based in London. Uh, as a native of Northern California with a degree from Stanford, no less, you would think I'd be the ideal person to lead this discussion. I'm sorry to break it to you. I, uh, I was the one peddling past all the tech startups and venture capital offices in Palo Alto on my way to class thinking, you know, I want a career in this other booming field, journalism. <laughs> I'm still struggling to explain that one to my parents. Welcome to our discussion of rapid technology development and societal security. If you have any doubts about the rapid part of our panel's title, consider for just a few moments how much our conversation has changed since last year's forum. Just a few weeks after last year's participants headed for the airport, a San Francisco firm called OpenAI released a little program called ChatGBT. Within two months, it had racked up more than 100 million users. It was as if a bomb went off. Discussions about AI and its implications had been underway for years, but somehow it had always seemed like some kind of sci-fi concept safely out there on the distant horizon. Now, suddenly, things are more urgent. Just last week, the UN Secretary General warned that AI was leading us across a Rubicon and into more danger than we can control. AI is on everyone's lips, a subject of both awe and fear. Yesterday, in a column about the prospects for regulating AI, one of my colleagues wrote that the disruption AI causes might one day make nuclear weapons look like firecrackers. The implications are all around us. AI-enabled deepfakes are already a concern in the 2024 U.S. election. AI and the threat it poses to creative work was at the heart of the recent strike by writers in Hollywood. The U.S. Air Force is testing a new generation of drones that will fly into combat alongside traditional fighter jets. Air Forces have always had wingmen, but we're talking about a swarm of rocket-powered planes with air-to-surface missiles. There are no pilots in the cockpit and no pilots on the ground. They will be flown by artificial intelligence. Of course, AI is already present in the war in Ukraine, alongside new drones, new software systems, new algorithms, and other technologies that are altering the face of warfare. And we have people on this panel who can tell you a lot more about that. But at the same time, in other ways, we seem to be stuck in some kind of time warp. The war raging just 900 miles from here is a throwback to another century. Trenches, tanks, dragon's teeth, soldiers crawling through minefields. How and why is this happening? Fortunately, we have a panel of people who made much smarter career decisions than I did and are expertly positioned to help us navigate this subject. Please let me introduce them now. And as I do so, perhaps each could take a couple minutes to tell us a bit about who you are and what you're working on. We'll start with Wendy Anderson, who's Senior Vice President, National Security at Palantir Technologies. Well, good morning. Um, I just wanted to open the panel by congratulating everyone in the room who is not an American, um, because it appears as if by the end of the day, you will still have your government fully operational <laughs> and not shut down. Mm -hmm. um, my name is, is Wendy Anderson. I've been at Palantir for almost four years. Um, I'm a longtime national security person, professional in the United States, um, having served time in the United States Senate on the Intelligence Committee just after 9-11, on the Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee just as the Department of Homeland Security was being established. Uh, in Washington. I then had the opportunity to go into the Defense Department and serve in the Obama administration with someone at the time who was the lowly number three in the Department of Defense, Ash Carter. Uh, 
He was the undersecretary at the time for acquisition, technology, and logistics, probably one of the most capable uh, humans uh, I have ever had the privilege of knowing. Uh, had a five-year, very intense, as you might imagine, set of years with him and Secretaries Gates, Panetta, and Chuck Hagel, with whom I ended my Defense Department tour. Those were still very much the 9-11 years and the post-9-11 years from which we have, um, uh, perhaps in some ways, looking at the challenge set now, um, uh, you know, exited uh, with, with a different set of, of fears, anxieties, and concerns. I'll leave it there, but I'm very interested in, in hearing from all of you over the next day and a half or two, and I'm really grateful to be a part of this panel with such talented colleagues. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, next, Pekka Lorila, co-founder of ICI, a Finnish company uh, whose constellation of satellites are circling overhead even as we speak. Uh, last night we were talking and Pekka told me that there are 30 finished, Finnish licensed objects in space and his company accounts for 27 of those. <laughs> Go ahead, Pekka. <laughs> uh, rough numbers, yes. Uh, yeah, it, it's not the length of my CV that probably got me here. Uh, I went <laughs> to the university here in, in, in Finland, in Aalto University, and we started this company, and here we are. Uh, that's the entire length of <laughs> the, the, the CV. Um, but um, uh, yeah, it's probably probably the company uh, then. then. So um, uh, what I saw on a sort of vision level, what we're trying to do is, is uh, create sort of similar you know, categoric shift of or, or categoric piece of digital infrastructure as as satellite navigation is, is to ourselves today, um, but but do that on on the sort of situational awareness. So so uh, we're trying to create uh, a, a system that you know really can give you sort of kind of infrastructure level reliability and availability of situational awareness of what is happening around you and. Uh, you know, do that on an objective basis also on what's happening around the world. And what does that mean in, in practice? Uh, Technology-wise, we design, build, operate uh, these small satellites that uh, have this sensor called synthetic aperture radar, which means that we can produce uh, imagery in all conditions, uh, day and night, uh, you know, cloudy or, or rain or or sunshine, um, and then that means that we can push for the both the sort of availability and reliability uh, to a to to a new level, and uh, it may not be a very obvious thing to think about, but indeed it is true that today the largest constellation of these type of radar imaging satellites is actually. Finish uh, in in the world. So, sort of, if you were to place a bet, uh, sort of, uh, something happens in the world. Statistically speaking, um, the, the sort of first opportunity to take an image of an event, it just might be actually ours. Mm. Um, and uh, ISI operates. You know, we're headquartered here in Finland, uh, but we have you know very big presence in in, in US as well. We operate also no registered uh, US flagged uh, assets as well for the US national security, um, and, and then. Also, a big operations in, uh, in in Warsaw in Poland. Thank you, Pekka. Next, James Apatharai, NATO Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges. Uh, so, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, very brief bio: uh, Canadian. Uh, I went to uh, university in Canada, but then actually my first job was to be a journalist, uh, which I did for a year and a half, and realized that. I didn't, I didn't have any insight into the future of the profession, but I knew I was bad at it. So I went to, uh, and they knew I was bad at it. Uh, so went to the Canadian Defense Department, then came to NATO, and I've done various things there. Right now, uh, I help to, to lead the uh, division that works on uh, innovation, emerging and disruptive technologies, but also we're responsible for uh, cyber defense, uh, energy security, security implications of climate change and what to do about it. Uh, hybrid and the protection of critical undersea infrastructure. So there's like a lot in there. But I, I took this job and asked for this job precisely in part to be able to work with uh, important companies like this. Uh, so I'm really glad to be here. Excellent. Thank you, James. Anu Bradford, a native of Finland and the Henry L. Moses Professor of Law and International Organization at Columbia Law School. 
Thank you, Greg, and uh, truly delighted to be always when I'm invited to speak in Helsinki, it is a, a special pleasure. Mm -hmm. So um, I teach at Columbia Law School. I mainly focus on the regulation of global economies, so international trade. So I, for a long time, did not consider that, that my remit really included national security. But now that we are weaponizing the global economy for geopolitical aims and uh, international trade is much more about national security exceptions to that international trade. So that has also then become much more of an interest to me. So last couple of years, I've been mainly focusing on digital economy, and I just came out this week with the book, Digital Empires, the Global Battle to Regulate Technology. So um, where I focus on the differences between the United States and China and the European Union in their attempts to regulate technology. And so artificial intelligence is obviously a big part of that conversation. So. Thank you again. I'm delighted to be here. Perfect, perfect. If it's okay, why don't we start with in the middle of the news and let's just start by talking a bit about Ukraine. Um, I'd like to read a passage from a recent article that appeared in the Post. Um, this is what it said. Two Ukrainian military officers peer at a laptop. On the screen are detailed maps of Bakhmut, overlaid with targeting intelligence. Most of it obtained from commercial satellites. We can see jagged trenches, thermal images of artillery fire, even a tank marked with a Z behind a picket fence, uploaded by a Ukrainian spotter on the ground. Maybe, Wendy, it would make sense to start with you here. Does this, does this ring any bells, this software? And if, <clears throat> whether, that's, whether it does or doesn't, what are we, what are we talking about when we talk about software, artificial intelligence, and the intersection with warfare? No, Greg, I appreciate the, the question, and, and I think I would, I would just start off by saying I'm not going to dive into any specifics of what we may or may not be doing um, on the software front with uh, okay. regards to the defense piece of Ukraine. There have been pieces come out, uh, a lot of pieces in the last year and a half, and, and you can certainly read those and wonder uh, uh, what it is that you're reading. I'm happy to have other conversations about this. What I will say is that you know, Palantir is one company of many different tech and defense technology companies that are doing any number of things technologically to support our Ukrainian friends and allies. We are engaged in supporting the investigations of war crimes atrocities or alleged war crimes, war crimes atrocities with the Office of the Prosecutor General. We are supporting multiple demining efforts. We are supporting, as the data platform, the resettlement of Ukrainian refugees across Central and Eastern Europe and even into the United States. Uh, we are now engaging in the reconstruction efforts and so forth. To Greg's question, and it's a very important one, what I'd love to do for just a second, interested in what my colleagues would have to say, is to say that, you know, there is a, a uh, very compelling set of uses or very compelling set of ways that software is being leveraged by the Ukrainians. I would make the statement that Ukraine might be one of the tech-savviest countries in all of Europe at this particular point. The entrepreneurial activity, of course, there's an existential underpinning of that. Um, the creativity, the experimentation, uh, in the field uh, by warfighters themselves of using this tech uh, for their own advantage, I think is pretty extraordinary. What are they actually doing? In a couple of sentences, you know, if you have software uh, or you have capabilities that allow for the secure integration of data from satellites, from intelligence sources, um, the capacity to translate languages simultaneously uh, that are not, you know, obviously uh, your own, the capacity to draw in sensor data, and you have the ability to do that in one place that you can see, experience, and leverage, knowing it's safe, and also knowing that there are data privacy and civil liberties protocols built into the software itself, what you have is decision advantage. What you have is the speed to act, the speed to understand where you are situationally, 
and make a much set of quicker, informed database decisions with data at scale. That is where the Ukrainians, I think, competitive advantage comes in here. And it is a way, a central way that I think software is a critical element or an enabler uh, of what the Ukrainians are doing against the Russians. Pekka, Wendy just gave an excellent description of how this, all of this information is knitted together on the ground. Maybe you can talk a bit about how things have changed in space that feeds data into these systems that the Ukrainians are taking advantage of. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, I think before going there, I mean, like when I think of it from the sort of ISI perspective, that the name ISI originally comes from uh, you know monitoring sea ice for for uh, you know shipping operations and. Arctic uh, oil and gas operations, and uh, you know, all, all all the way from 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 that time, you know, I think like one of the, the sort of uh, value statements, if if you will, uh, that that you know we we laid out was was that that the sort of uh, you know when you know what's happening around you, you can operate more efficiently and safely, um, yes. and um, and you know that's true, uh, you know, in in wide variety of fields, and and uh, and of course. Uh, you know, Ukraine is, is one example of, of, of those fields, and um, um, the I think the development in it one sense, you, I think you could equate something that is maybe more visible the way how sort of commercial drones became mm -hmm. just like a very visible, very widely, very innovatively utilized part of the the. Um, uh, Activities on the battlefield. Uh, in in one sense, you know, you could say that sort of similar, uh, maybe less visible uh, utilization, you know, than than then, you know has has been uh, has has happened uh, on on the sort of space side as well. Um, and uh, it it has to do with relatively similar underlying reasons that like you know now there are sort of almost industrial scale uh, private operators, you know, that, that, that can really, um, you know, produce um, uh, availability of peak capacity in, in, in a way that maybe, uh, maybe sort of national programs, projects, uh, actors, you know, couldn't. Uh, and, and then, you know, the, the, uh, the ability to utilize, uh, you know, those type of capabilities in a sort of very Collaborative and innovative way, I think you know, is 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 this the sort of defining thing that 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 is different now than it was maybe five years or ten years. A saturation effect, kind of. You could say so. Maybe like saturation is in in that sense is maybe not the right word because still, from the point of view of sort of situational awareness, I think there is still a lack of capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that 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 we I I wouldn't say that the that the sort of uh, battlefield is uh, fully real time transparent today in Ukraine by any means. I think it's, it's still a question of of uh, you know all the capacity that can be brought available is being utilized and it's not necessarily enough yet. But uh, but but you know I think you know that's one way to put it that like you know then. There will be a world where, uh, where, where uh, you know, the companies like ours and and uh, and the sort of commercial ecosystem around it is actually able to push, you know, that visibility in kind of you know infrastructure level, real time, in the same way as you know today you use satellite navigation on on on, on civilian side, you know, just assuming that it's there, it's there all the time, mm -hmm. and it's it's sort of real time and accurate enough that you don't think about it. Today we're maybe not exactly there yet. Okay. James, can we pan back a bit from Ukraine and, and ask the, what are, how, how do you approach this, thinking through these technologies and capabilities in a NATO context? Sure, so, um, and, and this has all been really enlightening. NATO is really leaning in on innovation now, like more than ever before and, and in different ways. And the reasons are very clear. One is what you've already highlighted, which is if you look at Ukraine, the Ukrainians are numerically outmatched in every possible category, but they're holding their own in part because of the innovative development and integration of these new technologies. And I, I really want to stress the word integration, because it's not like on the one hand there is a tank war, and on the other hand there is a tech war. It is the integration of these technologies um, and capabilities which is the way forward. Uh, so that's part one. Part two is we also recognize that 
strategic competition, in particular with China, mm. is playing itself out very much on the field of technology. And we are not necessarily winning. So if you look at a recent uh, analysis by the Australian Security Policy Institute, it's widely quoted. You can look at the parameters, but basically it's correct. Uh, they said that out of uh, 44 uh, key emerging and disruptive technologies, uh, China is on par or ahead of us in 37, in some cases with a monopolistic advantage and pulling away, uh, despite the fact that we're trying to catch up. So for both these reasons, and because we recognize, of course, that most innovation now comes from the private sector and not from the government sector, not totally, but more and more, uh, we've leaned in. So what are we doing? We're putting out or getting allies to agree on strategy after strategy on key emerging and disruptive technologies like AI, like autonomy, soon biotech and quantum and novel tech, novel materials. So we're just moving through that. Second, we have created uh, basically our transatlantic DARPA. We call it Diana. So a structure to engage with the startup world, to get access to commercially available dual use technologies. And what we're not trying to do is reach out to the companies that are already in the defense associations. What we're trying to do is engage with the companies that aren't. Uh, and we really feel a change from two or three years ago even, uh, where a lot of the companies didn't think about security or leaned away from a, an organization like NATO. That's totally changed because of what's happened in Ukraine. So Diana just launched its first three challenges. We were expecting about 400 startups to apply. We got 1,300. And they're like beating down the door to say, we want to contribute, sometimes without uh, asking for, for too much in the way of funding. And then finally, and then I'll, I'll stop, um, we've also created uh, a uh, just over 1 billion euro deep tech investment fund, a VC. Uh, it's the one of the four in Europe over a billion euros, and they will, over 15 years, invest in deep tech, patient capital, uh, in the same way that the Chinese do, uh, to try to sort of fill the gaps in funding, protect our industries, and foster new technology. So that's sort of the broad parameters of what we're doing. Can you take just a second longer and talk about that last piece where you said that the, the, the Ukraine war has altered the relationship or the possibility of relationships with the private sector? Absolutely. So. I think everybody in this room might remember, for example, even Google staff, when Google was signing a, or considering signing a contract with the Pentagon, there was a little bit of a mini revolt, and actually they didn't do it at the time. Because there was concern about you know, working with defense, there's ESG restrictions in Europe which make it difficult, and basically a lot of companies just thought, okay, well, it's not really worth working with, uh, with defense uh, for all these reasons, or didn't think about it. But uh, a couple of things changed. The Ukraine war has really, I think, sharpened a lot of minds. Uh, and, you know, we just heard uh, from both these companies how they've leaned in on, on that. And I have to say, it's been incredibly impressive to see how many companies, big and small, instantly reacted, provided free services to the Ukrainians, mm -hmm. still do. Uh, I mean, in the case of Microsoft, which is public, they are spending tens of millions to upload their data into the cloud, to keep it in the cloud, to help rebuild their systems. There's many other companies, some of which are being paid, some of which aren't. Uh, so there's a real uh, shift in mindset. The second thing that has sort of helped from our point of view is we have had the allies agree to principles of responsible use for, for example, AI tools, autonomous platforms, and we've published them. They're on their website. So when we go, when I go to, to startups and scale-ups and say, okay, this is what we'd like your, your product, uh, when I, I feel hesitation, I'm like, look at the website. This is how we're going to use it. And I can sense and we can see uh, a change in attitude. I mean, the other reasons we have, the other reason we have these principles of responsible use, aside from being democratic countries, is the military also wants to know <coughs> that the tool that they're being given by us is going to follow some principles of responsible use That's before right. they unleash it, an autonomous platform or an AI piece of software, or they won't use it mm. because they need to know that it's not going to go in the wrong way and you know whack a wedding or whack them. Uh, so uh, it really needs to be 
uh, baked into the software. So we're developing, uh, my division is developing a tool that the entire NATO enterprise has to use before acquiring an AI tool that ensures that it follows these principles. And that's helping a lot with the private sector. Really interesting. Anu, we've been mostly talking about Ukraine, which especially to this audience, we would probably perceive as a, a just cause. You know, companies, Western companies helping a Western ally in a just way. Um, but these aren't the only scenarios that technology and innovation conjure. And I wonder if you can help to sort of sketch out the other scenarios um, and, and build on what James was saying about the competition um, that NATO and the Western world faces here. Yeah. So if you sort of zoom out to the broader sort of geopolitical climate, and Ukraine is obviously a, at, at the heart of the way we perceive the biggest geopolitical challenges, but also looking at it from the United States, the, the heightened tension between the two technological superpowers, China and the United States, is very central. And I think there is a deep understanding that the uh, technology is at the heart and center of uh, who wins this, this, this battle at many levels. And I think there is a sort of resolution from both sides to, to approach this conflict, which is the massive investments and making sure that the technological supremacy is not ceded to the, uh, to the adversary. So I think what we're witnessing now is that um, Technology has become the battlefield uh, whereby China has, for instance, declared that it wants to be an AI superpower by 2030. The United States is increasingly conscious that that is a realistic possibility, and the U.S. really needs to step up its game to make sure that that will not happen. So there's the question whether one of them is prone, destined to win uh, this contest, and I don't think that is um, necessarily evident that there is there's an answer to that that if you think about what are the the the, um, the attributes uh, in this uh, AI race so I would say probably there's four things that that we are watching so one thing is that if you want to be an AI superpower whether it is then for commercial applications or then also the military applications or the technology you do need to have data and this is where the United States is very concerned that China has a, a population that is large, that is very actively online, and where state has very little limitations in harnessing the data, uh, and then using that also to, to developing AI. But um, what you also need is the hardware, the computing power, and that is one of those domains now where the United States has been able to use its choke points and then restrict China's access uh, to uh, AI. So the advanced chips is, is a requisite for leading uh, in the development of AI technologies, and that's where I would say that none of the, the superpowers are going to be technologically sovereign. They're not going to be autonomous. The supply chains are very complex and, and uh, expensive to replicate, but that's where the United States, working together with Japan and the Dutch, have been able to use export control and, and potentially limit China's ability to then acquire uh, the most advanced uh, uh, chips. Um, but you also need talent in general. So you need data, you need the, the computing power, you need talent. And that's, I think, where I still think that the United States is in a very strong position. That's where there's a lot of, and we talked about already how the U.S., uh, James mentioned how the U.S. Uh, private tech companies are very critical providers of uh, technologies for Ukraine, but also um, that is the assumption that they will help the U.S. in other conflicts as well. So the talent where AIP being developed is still something where the United States uh, is, uh, uh, is at the very strong position. But then I think the, the fourth piece, and this goes a little bit to what Wendy was saying too, how skillfully Ukrainians have acquired and adopted the technology. So you need to have the institutions that are able to adopt these technologies and integrate them into their military architecture. And this is something, James, I'd be curious. I was in a recent conversation with uh, your colleague from NATO who mentioned that, for instance, the average time that the procurement contracts takes in NATO has been traditionally 16.2 years. 
So obviously in the age of acquiring AI technologies, you are not negotiating with startups for 16 years <laughs> to, to get one of their technologies yes. integrated into the NATO command structures. <laughs> so it's one of those that I think there are many pieces to the technological competition that is now at the heart of the big geopolitical conflicts. And uh, each power struggles on some dimensions of these ones while being resolute in trying to make sure that they build up those capabilities. Okay, thank you. So one of the things that comes up in, in the panel, in many of the panels yesterday and will undoubtedly come up today, is NATO countries and which countries are and are not meeting their pledges to meet certain uh, requirements of investment in defense capabilities. Wendy, I wanted to read a, a short line from a, an op-ed that you published not too long ago saying that we believe NATO members should include an additional explicit pledge as part of their commitments to spend more on defense, and that is to invest in software and data-driven platforms as a core capability. Why did you say that, and do you see that happening? And then I want to get James's uh, <laughs> views on, on how, how NATO views this question. I would say to, to James, whose comments um, I very much appreciated, um, that we'd love to work with you on this idea. Uh, y y you all, uh, particularly the, the bureau component that you and David and others lead, mm -hmm. um, has been truly uh, open door in a way that I haven't experienced NATO institutionally mm. in, in years prior. Um, so the last few years, a large part of that I do think is Ukraine, as you rightly said, um, have really shifted uh, dynamics within sort of the NATO bureaucracy. So I, I really do want to offer that piece of feedback. You know, I, I think, uh, again, you know, Ukraine has highlighted uh, the leveraging power of, of software, um, especially on the, on the operational side, as we talk about. And one of the things that I was both in some ways unsurprised by uh, and in other ways disappointed by um, as, as an attendee of the, of the NATO public forum during the NATO summit uh, in Vilnius in July, was that the word software wasn't used once. Mm. You know, and I, and I was sort of thinking, well, you know, I am one of these American sort of tech defense people, like maybe you should get over yourself and just really listen into the other substantive pieces of the conversation. But I thought, you know, we're, we're at, a, it's 2023. Um, and because of what Anu and James both said about uh, China's uh, increasing dominance in this space, we don't have time. And that's not a dramatic statement, right? It's not a statement that I'm just making because I think it's interesting. Um, it happens to be true. And the data shows it. Obviously, I won't get into what any of the intelligence says, but Anu brings up a report that is incredibly concerning. So. For us, uh, as a part of the tech sector or the defense technology um, community within the private sector in the United States, there is almost nothing uh, in terms of how to exercise deterrence, but also to exercise uh, operational capability than the role of software. NATO seems to understand very well, just like our U.S. Department of Defense does, how to talk hardware, right? It's what we've done. That's most of our defense industrial base, and we are grateful for them. We don't make things in the Department of Defense in the United States, right? NATO institutionally doesn't make hardware. We rely on industry to do that. But the way that industry has traditionally been thought of, even really up to now, is hardware. Um, and what we're trying to say is it's not one or the other, it really is both. And this goes back to the integration and the interoperability point that James made. We're trying to figure out how to not close off some piece uh, of, of this that is central, but how to open the aperture in terms of how we think about the industrial base, how we even use software to extend the life of legacy systems or of those hardware pieces uh, in NATO or in uh, uh, the United States. So we'd like to be able to have this conversation of how do we include software in the mix as we're talking about the importance of software and data in modern warfare, which Ukraine, the example we're discussing, has really highlighted for us in the last two years. James, anything to add? Yeah, uh, uh, just a few quick points. Um, I, I share 
the frustration. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and I think it's important to look at some of the reasons why. One is, of course, legacy contracting and engagement with, with mm. big defense primes. That, that's a reality. It is also the case that there is a massive focus in NATO now on heavy metal. Because what people see in Ukraine, because we don't have enough, uh, and so you know, if, if I were to pick the number one thing the Secretary General spends most time on right now, it is uh, spooling up defense industry to be able to meet the shortfalls that we have and to be able to supply the Ukrainians. So that's taking up a huge amount of, uh, of effort. It's also the case that we have a lot of muscle memory in this area, but also, and this is something that we're struggling with in my division, the leadership, I think, in most of our countries, and certainly in NATO, they are really busy. They don't have a lot of time. And to get them to understand, to spend the time to understand how this technology <clears throat> works, what it offers, takes time. That it's, time it's tough to get. Uh, that being said, we are trying. Uh, so uh, we, for example, last week or the week before, had a, a big council meeting on AI. We brought in two leaders on AI, and then I spoke afterwards. Uh, and they made exactly the same case that we just heard. It's software. For a minimal investment in software, you get an exponential increase in the effectiveness of the heavy metal. So it's heavy metal and techno together, uh, which is <laughs> not some kind of music I want to hear. but. Uh, <laughs> but it is absolutely the case. But they were really making this appeal. Uh, the, but then two other points where I think uh, it's worth mentioning that we're making some progress. This deep tech fund that I just uh, mentioned earlier, um, I proposed to allies, and they agreed, which was the first in NATO's history, that this, the money allocated to this fund would be counted against the 2% of defense spending. So that really cracked. Mm. Uh, mm. Like we broke through a wall there. So now innovation is counted against that. Yeah. And I think we can build on that. Uh, second, to say that we've taken just decisions in the last couple of years, including related to Diana, but also to the fund, uh, on operational experimentation, meaning we're going to take the startups that are working on these new technologies into the field into the exercises, and we're starting in the next couple of months, actually, to say, OK, bring your tech right to the user, right to the sharp end, and try it out. And then we can improve, and it'll start to build a culture of the people who are at the end, the sharp end of the spear, using the tech. And they're going to call back and say, hey, I want this. Because when we bring AI tools to soldiers and show them how it works mm -hmm. and what they get out of it, they turn around and say, hey, uh, Colonel, I want this, and that'll work its way up, as well as just starting at the top. Okay. Pekka, I want to turn the conversation back to you for a minute. Uh, I was um, reading a book by Michael Vickers, probably somebody that Wendy knows well. He just came out with a book. It's a terrific read. He was the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, uh, CIA officer, and, and, a, and a very forward thinker in, in militarily. And one of the passages in his book really jumped out at me. He said that space superiority will be to warfare in the 21st century what air superiority was in the 20th century. <laughs> What, what is he getting at there, and, and why? If you can help us understand um, what this means. Maybe I can. Uh, maybe I can. Uh, I'll just comment briefly on, 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 on the point that, you know, which is made about software that, that, that I mean, maybe it's obvious, uh, but, but of course, you know, in the, in the sort of world of modern uh, hardware tech, if, if, if you will, that like in order to, to uh, get the large constellation of air satellites to do what we want it to do, then, you know, out of the 300 people engineering organization of iSight, and of course, you know, 200 of them are software engineers for sure, uh, that, that, that you know that that ratio is is you know true really for any sort of modern you know deep tech company that that the sort of true true focus on hardware is is that like it's it's a critical enabling piece um, but but like a lot of the functionality of course you know these days just it is software and um, and you know it's just as like you know why was Tesla able to build such an effective platform you know because they started from scratch and because they started from software and and then went on to build the hardware component on it and why are many of the legacy automakers you know really struggling to get up there is this you know because there's like 
that, that whole kind of ecosystem of third-party providers of, 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 of various uh, pieces that you then have to try and integrate, and it's really hard, uh, and, and then you're almost better off starting from scratch, and that's what many of them have done. Um, but, but to the point um, of, of um, space superiority, I mean, you know, the ob obvious thing, of course, you know, is, is, is uh, you know, exactly the, the idea of kind of it won't take that long um, to be in a place where like having the sort of space superiority means that then you can have the sort of true transparency of battlefield in, in a way that, you know, if you really can truly in real time know everything that is happening, it's a different, if it's a different environment. Uh, and, and then similarly, if you can provide the, the uh, I mean, and, and that's not just taking photos it's not just uh, you know imaging with a radar it's it's about understanding the signals environment you know where are transmitters of really anything you know all the way down to maybe not just detecting the transmitters but you know receiving decoding signals of the transmitters so like really starting to have like a, you know really really true transparency of, of what is going on and then of course you know that done from uh, space and having, having having superiority there you know means that then you know at its at its extreme you know if only one side has that it's quite a big advantage space in in the same way as of course in like when you're thinking of you know air superiority you're thinking of capability to you know Strike. do kinetic impact uh, to the battlefield I, I don't think that's really a component in in, in sort of a realistic uh, space superiority scenarios, like it is, it is more the sort of control of this sort of information sphere. Right. Um, um, uh, but you know, I guess needless to say that that is a very important component. Anu, let's talk a bit about the 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 I, the competing ideas for regulating, controlling these emerging technologies. We, we see AI constantly um, compared to the dawn of the nuclear age. Um, Sam Altman even likes to compare himself, the, the chief executive of, of OpenAI likes to compare himself to Oppenheimer every chance he gets. Um, <laughs> at, the, at the start of the nuclear age, new institutions were created, including things like the IAEA. Um, to try to address these questions and issues of proliferation and security and equity. Um, should there be a similar approach in the context of AI and other technologies? I think the question whether there should be is, is easy to answer. I think all of us would benefit from a predictable, solid international framework that helps us mitigate any of these downside uh, scenarios and dangers that are associated with AI. But it's a very different question whether any such agreement is feasible in today's environment. And there I am, I am rather pessimistic. So there seems to be sort of globally a, a shared understanding that AI needs guardrails, even the developers of AI, including Sam Altman, have come up with, with pleas for, for such uh, uh, regulation. But that there's no global consensus on what that regulation ought to look like. That even if we look at the major uh, economic and uh, sort of digital powers, uh, the US, China, and the EU, they have chosen a very different path. So the Americans are generally following their market-driven instincts, and even with AI, there seems to be now a path where we pursue some voluntary commitments that we obtain from the leading tech, uh, tech firms. So the US is, there are bills uh, pending in Congress, but the likelihood of there being really sort of solid binding uh, uh, legislation in the US are, are rather remote. Um, for China, AI is a really interesting uh, uh, tool. Um, so it, it serves in many ways the, the Chinese authoritarian goals. It extends the surveillance network. China is one of the leaders in facial recognition technology. There's 500 million surveillance cameras, AI enabled uh, uh, in, in China. So AI can be very helpful for China, but AI can also threaten the, the political goals of the, the country. If you think about generative AI, um, China has been cracking down that with very stringent regulations because that can undermine the censorship regime in the country. 
So you really need to restrict the kind of data that you can use to train AI models. Otherwise, you, you might lose control on what is the conversation that emerges in the country. So the entire kind of political stability in the country uh, can, can be threatened. So that's one reason why we have actually seen China pursue domestically uh, regulation of AI. The EU is in its comfortable territory, not being the developer of technologies, but the regulator of technologies. So it is now at the forefront of actually pursuing binding regulation on AI. We are expecting to have the EU's AI Act finalized still in the end of this year. But if you look at the time horizons, it would still, even if it's finalized, it takes about two years before it applies and actually constrains these companies. And a lot can happen in the age of uh, AI. So. Um, I think there's sort of limited amount that the regulation is coming. It's coming mainly from the EU, but that still doesn't solve the question, Greg, if I may speak a little bit to this international cooperation point, that, that none of that amounts to uh, an international regulatory framework, and especially if we think about weaponizing AI in the military context. So there is no global treaty banning AI-enabled autonomous weapons. Um, and I don't think such treaty will be negotiated in today's political environment. So we still have in the, the sort of the national security context, we still have the laws of war apply also to AI, international humanitarian law. So that should set some guardrails. But I think there has been a recognition that we would need to be something more specific. But what we've seen, um, the U.S. came up with a declaration uh, in February this year, where basically it communicated very clearly that it is committed to an ethical use of AI in the military context. So there will be no such thing as AI making decisions of the use of nuclear weapons. Um, in AI used in the military context, uh, you do need to have human in the chain. So humans are making those decisions. And, and generally, um, just making <coughs> sure that they're, they're sort of ethical accountable principles applied. There also was in, in February a summit hosted by the Netherlands and South Korea, where 60 countries agreed to a sort of call for action, recognizing that there are harms and uh, we, we should be um, sort of co uh, approaching the use of AI in a prudent and transparent way so that we can mitigate those, those conflicts. But at the same time, all those fall way short uh, from uh, setting some binding guardrails that would really regulate the militarization of AI in a way that would give us the kind of comfort that ultimately we would hope to have. Anybody else want to add anything? <clears throat> Maybe maybe I'll um, yeah. if do you if you don't please, mind please I you know I I uh, it, while Palantir is not strictly you know an an AI company we obviously work very closely with with AI vendors to you know identify ways to safely and and responsibly deploy their solutions to support a number of different uh, missions uh, whether they're U.S. government or whether they're um, in the commercial space. But you know we do we do speak from two decades or so um, of of experience in the domain of of AI and 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 particularly operational uh, AI. Uh, I, I you know one of the things that I I do want to make sure to to just put out there because their companies deal with this question in in different ways and we are now as Palantir a part again of that ecosystem of technology companies that have recently um, spent time on the Hill with Senator uh, Schumer, who is the leader of, of the Democrats um, in the Senate, who pulled together a bipartisan conversation for all members of the United States Senate about what should the guardrails be for using AI. Um, I don't know that you would have seen this or maybe have been interested, but, but pretty much every single um, consequential CEO of every consequential technology company gathered with this group to commit to not only an enduring conversation, um, but to figuring out what are those guardrails and how do we responsibly figure out how to legislate, um, which again, as Anu rightly said, is just gonna be extremely difficult in this political environment. But I think the one thing that was uh, I really took away of note is the human in the loop. Um, and there is a perception at times wrong uh, that, you know, the American tech industry is sort of this Wild West, you know, group of humans who are just out there wanting to. It's just not the case. Um, 
you know, it, it is a group of, uh, and I won't talk about specific personalities uh, in that group, <laughs> uh, but, but it is a group, all in all, uh, of pretty thoughtful humans who are trying also to figure out how to partner with uh, government leaders and and other thought leaders on on how we ensure um, you know these technologies are used in ways that that are safe and appropriate. The human in the loop piece is really central to that. Palantir certainly has been behind that from the beginning. I would just say one other thing, which is the the something that we talk about a lot, which is the field to learn. You know, it's highly contextualized, and at least in terms of how we have. Uh, engaged with these capabilities and, and, and technologies. We have been in specific environments um, and worked with them and so fielded them, uh, uh, so to speak. And, and that's how the experimentation happens in circumstances that have restrictions and some sort of controls, but certainly a human who is always there making that last decision. James. Uh, just a couple of thoughts to add to it. One is, and I speak for myself, not, not necessarily for NATO, but uh, I think if I'm concerned about any area in the development of AI, it is probably least with the military. Uh, because mm. this is a, an organization in the West, in every one of our countries, that thinks deeply on these issues, that has rules and regulations about how to operate, that understands perfectly well what the consequences are, including the prisoner's dilemma we have with other parties that are not necessarily going to go for human in the loop, human on the loop, or human at all, but they really think it through, uh, and they are responsible for what they do. I'm more concerned about the other aspects of the development, rapid development of AI tools and their proliferation. Uh, mm. For example, so you have disinformation, you mentioned this, uh, and it is being super turbocharged. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think it was uh, Google that just took down what they said was the biggest, no, YouTube, the biggest disinformation campaign in history, which was Chinese deepfakes uh, surrounding uh, the floods. There's political interference linked to the first, but as we look forward to the U.S. election, uh, the three major platforms have all uh, diminished their content moderation, not just X, the artist formerly, formerly known as Twitter. Uh, so that's that, but also cyber defenses are fundamentally undermined by generative AI. Mm. Uh, it is extremely easy now to develop malicious code. Mm. Uh, and it is also, that's the next problem, is proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. It is extremely easy now to develop a novel virus. So I just read yesterday that uh, asking one of these generative AI tools, a company just published this, uh, they got from uh, a generative AI tool 600 new viruses developed by this platform in an hour. Uh, or uh, chemical weapons. You can ask them to build a chemical weapon from the household products you find in your house. This is now available to everybody. Uh, these tools are out on the dark web, so you can't control them. And also private companies, small companies, aren't necessarily going along uh, the same route as the big ones. So mm -hmm. Clear Eye or Clear View, whatever it's called, yes. put out this facial recognition technology, which now you can just put on a pair of goggles. I can look at anyone in this room and get their entire biography in one second. Uh, so when that is widely available through the hardware, uh, that makes it possible we don't have privacy anymore. And that's right now, that's not in two years, it's not in four years, and these tools are you know, learning exponentially, including as they start to digest video. So I think those are the bigger problems, yeah. and the focus on the military right. is probably the lowest of our problems. Okay, everybody wants to jump in on this one. Anu, you had your hand up. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think very briefly, it's really that one of the greatest promises of AI is the kind of democratizing potential of the technology, that really that it can be accessible everywhere. But that is also exactly the vulnerability that you talk about, that mm -hmm. even if we were to talk about arms control treaties one day, states agreeing to declarations, there's a bunch of actors that would be the recipients of these technologies. Nuclear weapons cannot be acquired yeah. as easily by individuals. This technology, the proliferation, I completely share your concern, James, and then it is in the hands of the actors that are part in no treaties and no conversations and no declarations, and it's very hard for us to, uh, us to uh, control. So that is certainly, and then just one uh, comment on, I 
I am very concerned about this amplified disinformation and what it can done if it starts taking down political institutions in the countries. How do we then govern AI? And there, the United States openness, it is a big vulnerability to Huge the country. Huge vulnerability, yeah. Yeah, completely. Paka, you also wanted to add. Uh, yeah, I was going to say something that may or may not be obvious again. Um, but I think like the, the other, other place where I mean, we've seen uh, sort of ISI intersecting with the whole kind of world of AI, specifically on the generative AI side, is, is, is that the, the um, like if you think of a world where sort of, you know, anything or nothing can be true, uh, you know, just, just because of the, the amount of content that be, can, can, can be generated, then, then one of the other sort of like value statements that like we've seen emerge very clearly is that it's sort of, that it only makes sense to agree on things if you can agree on the facts. And, uh, and you know, that's another, another thing that the sort of space uh, and, and sort of like the, the kind of infrastructure level availability of facts of what is actually happening on the ground for real. Uh, this is something where we've seen uh, you know, that, that world sort of like intersecting what we are doing um, as a company. Interesting. I wanted, we, we're burning really low on time. I want to try to get to one or two questions from the audience, if we could. Hand way up in the back there. Let's start there. There you go. Um, hello. We, we can hear you. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. My name is Jan Sartz. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, NATO Stratcom Center of Excellence. Thank you very much for a um, very interesting discussion. Um, for a context, uh, we work on the information space and do a lot of work on generative AI. And we actually run now the projects how generative AI is affecting disinformation and etc. And the conclusion so far is very much with what you've said is that there will be very likely no technology that will be able to tell apart mm -hmm. real from generated um, uh, content in the online, all sorts of content. So in a way, really making it bleak. But my question really is, when we talk about these emerging technologies and think about national security and the defense, aren't we like following the established path of thinking just like the way it affects the battlefield? or directly the military. Because basically the <clears throat> fight starts from the will to fight and the decision to start the fight. And if I can take us back to uh, very, very early 2022, the idea of Putin was never to have such a fall. His idea, his plan was that allegedly in a very old school of way, his uh, FSB has taken over the control of the key decision-making nodes in Ukraine, and the Ukrainians wouldn't mind, so there wouldn't be really a full-scale war. What I'm bringing to is the idea that any opponent that has these available tools and techniques, AI, TikToks, generative AIs of their own, wouldn't they prefer to target our ability and readiness to fight, the will to fight, and the disabled to, ability to make the decision to fight, rather than actually the war fighting capability. Because to me, given you know the issues we're having in democratic processes, societal processes, and number of allies, is a far more promising uh, pass Thank you. for them. Sorry. It's fine. Th so anybody want to take that on while we try to find at least one more, one more person to, um, you, you had to one ask back. a question? You had one back there if you wanted to take it immediately. Just take it? OK. Uh, on the far left. Thank you, uh, Alex Diel from the McDonald Laurie Institute in, in Ottawa. Amazing panel. Anu, you raised the point of disentangling supply chains for this and how difficult it is. And I'm curious if, you, if the panel might even expand on this for the, for the hardware piece. You know, how much of a, a um, you know problem is this in thinking about our security? And uh, you know, are the are these necessary investments? I and mean, does the disentangling have to happen, or you know, is it even a starting point for some? strategic calculations around interdependence. Thank you. Go ahead, James. So um, maybe I address each of these, but very quickly. Um, certainly share the view on um, information space. So 
Uh, and just for a uh, scary little detail, we had uh, three of the top um, uh, companies in that space uh, come into NATO, and uh, they all agreed, and they're competitors, uh, that uh, in their view, within five years, 90%, 90% of the content on the internet will be fake. And they're taking a snapshot now of the internet, which is not exactly a repository of truth, to compare it to five years from now. So it will have a lot of difficulty believing anything we see in five years, like almost nothing. And think through what all that means. Um, but I, I certainly share the view. If you look at Russian strategic doctrine, it's the, the red thread that runs through all of it is actually the cognitive thread. And even the physical moves, including military moves, are all designed to affect the way the opponent thinks, mm -hmm. to stop them from fighting in the first place, to stop them from fighting once you start. So it is about cognitive space, uh, and we definitely need to focus on that, uh, protecting our cognitive space uh, and actually getting into theirs. And, and if you look at what's happening in Russia right now, uh, they're using that same approach on their own population, mm -hmm. right? So the internet is controlled, there's no opposition, there's the media is controlled. But if, I mean, some of you will have seen this, you can start to see now that they're, the kids in school, little kids, five years old, are now training with weapons. Mm -hmm. In schools across the country, they are training the next generation to think in the way that the West is after them, they have to defend, it's a siege mentality, so it's all part of the same perspective, and, and we definitely need to take that into account and, and, and deal with it. Then on supply chains, just to mention from our point of view, one of the very interesting issues that we need to deal with is as we transition from a internal combustion and uh, carbon-based economy to a mineral-based electrified economy, including in the military, but also more widely, we need to try to avoid creating a new strategic dependency on an unreliable, different unreliable supplier uh, for essential you know, minerals and rare earths and other materials. So uh, that supply chain issue, I think, is primordial for us to have uh, economic and military security going forward. One more, one more question. Greg, before right we there. finish, could I say something? Oh, please, go ahead, go ahead right now. Um, I just wanted to, to make the point, I think what my three colleagues here have said um, really underscores the need for the technology, defense technology part of the private sector to really work with governments and to work with uh, international institutions. You know, I, I would just say, when, when James made the point about Google having its own internal sets of conversations about what was ethically appropriate for its workforce to do, and they made the decision in that particular set of circumstances to disengage from the Department of Defense, um, Palantir happened to be the entity that took over that work. Now, I'm not saying that to just say rah, rah, Palantir. Uh, <laughs> but I am saying that to, to suggest the conversations happening within the technology companies and cultures are super important. All of us have to go through them. We all have to wrestle with really uncomfortable things, and people will come out uh, where they come out. I think it is extremely important, given the geopolitical crises that we are forced to address, and the complexity and sort of chaos and uncertainty in a lot of the situations that, that sort of are proliferating around the world, that tech companies find ways to support government missions. Um, especially, I would say, from my own context, in the United States, to have technology companies that are willing to work with government, especially on the national security side, and especially when it's really uncomfortable to get to know one another and, and have ways to engage. For technology CEOs to be faced with the question, do we want to sell our tech to the Chinese? Mm -hmm. Palantir has made a decision absolutely not to do that. Palantir has also made the decision not to sell its technology to the Russians. Now, we made those decisions 20 years ago. Um, I'm not necessarily knocking other companies at all for playing in the biggest market uh, globally. But we've made a particular decision because we do understand that uh, you know, uh, the Chinese military is wanting to acquire these technologies to be dominant uh, 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 globally. We are not going to contribute to that. So I think it's interesting to also, from the American perspective, think about other CEOs, the questions that they might ask themselves about what they're going to do or not do on the basis of uh, what our adversaries uh, are doing. So I just wanted to make that last point. <laughs> 
I know we were going to try to get to one last question, oh, but we are over time, and I think we should probably break. I know the, some of our panelists will be around afterward and um, attending other panels on the conference in case that anybody else has any follow-up questions or thoughts that we couldn't get to today. I want to thank everybody for coming to the first session of the day and to thank um, the organizers. It's been a fabulous uh, conference already, uh, and thanks so much to all the members of the panel. This was a really, really stimulating conversation. Well Thank done. you, Greg. Thank you. Thank you.